Ironically enough, I think I've told a few of you the story already. I am going to be preaching out of 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. We had a, a, a little note left for us on Wednesday, uh, last week. We had visitors and left a, a little note in the pew that, that said 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, and number 11 was circle, circled. And Last week, we preached, I preached a sermon uh, called Rejoice Evermore. And you can go back and listen to the sermon, but my last point was basically brought up how the Bible says that, you know, the, that the saints are going to be washing their feet in the blood of the wicked, right? And that, and that, that was going to be a time of rejoicing when God actually brings forth his judgment against the wicked. And, um, and it's biblical. It's, it's completely found in the Bible. It's a concept that, that is something that, that, can't, that you can rejoice over of, of just God's judgment in general and writing things that are wrong and, and whatever. And um, what's funny is I didn't even preach like on reprobates or, or anything like that, yet that, of course, is what was left for me. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 is what people will turn to to try to combat the reprobate doctrine and say, see, look, it says and such were some of you, but you're, you know, I get that. Now, I just think it's kind of funny because I, I was already planning this sermon anyways, before that even happened, and of course, here we are now, we're going through it. I wish they came back tonight because, they, you know, I'm preaching right on the verse that they're, that they're talking about. But um, no, this isn't a reprobate doctrine either. What I want to point out, though, is what, what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is the sin of being effeminate. Now, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 is the only place in the entire Bible you're going to find this word effeminate. It's only there one time. But the concept and the teaching taught of, of you know, man, men being manly and not feminine is found mo in many places throughout the Bible. And it's not, just, it's not explicitly just spelled out, but the concept's there. Um, so look at verse number 9 here in 1 Corinthians 6. The Bible reads, Know ye not that the, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. And then it lists off all of these sins, right? Talking about the unrighteous. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And then it goes on. It lists a bunch of things, okay? Um, that word effeminate, now some of, the, some of the modern translations, and I'm not going to pull it out tonight to, to take a look at it, but I've seen this before. Some of them will say like, sodomites and homosexuals and you know like the way that they render this stuff and look effeminate does not mean you're homosexual or a sodomite or anything like that the word effeminate literally just means that you're being feminine but when you're a man because there's nothing wrong with being feminine if you're a woman right i mean if you're if you're a female you ought to be feminine you ought to be effeminate, but the word effeminate is used to describe a man who is not like a man, who does not have attributes that you would associate with being a man, but more of being like a woman. And unfortunately today we see this more and more and more in the young generation that's coming up. It's, it's an effeminate, you know, boys that are being raised in today's society. And it's being taught to be accepted, yea, even promoted as being the way that, we, you know, that that's our culture wants boys to grow up and be. I think there's many reasons for this. I think one of the big reasons is just the, as a result of broken homes and broken families where most children are, seem to be being raised by just their mom without having a good father figure in their life, without having someone to teach them how to be a man. And look, this is extremely important. You know, the... the, the the importance of the family and the family structure and the way that God has ordained that is huge. I mean, it's critical for, for raising children and bringing them up to be good, godly children in a crooked and perverse world. We have, and, and you know, anyone who has kids and you're married, you know all about this and it's common sense, and it ought to be common sense, the differences between men and women. God made us different. He made us, you know, he made us different for in a variety of ways on purpose because men and women complement each other. And when you're raising children, they need both sides. You shouldn't just have children being raised by dads or just being raised by moms. You should have moms and dads. Now look, I know there's many situations out there where, where people end up as you know, being a single parent. Okay, but that is not, that is far from ideal. And you have to do what, what, what you have to do as, as far as to, to raise your children these days. 
But that's also why, you know, Jesus Christ said, and the Bible says that God hates putting away. God hates divorce. God doesn't want you to get divorced. He, he says, you know, that you don't have grounds for a divorce, ultimately, except, you know, Jesus said, except for the cause of fornication. Well, guess what? Fornication happens before you even get married. Because otherwise it's called adultery, and adultery is a death sentence. So, really, and that's prior to consummating that marriage when you could get divorced. So you wouldn't have any children between each other anyways, people who are getting divorced. So, you know, according to God's law, the way that God set things up to be. Look, I realize there's a lot of sin and people don't listen to God's law. And then you get into all kinds of screwy situations. You're not supposed to be committing fornication, which is having that relationship with the opposite gender prior to marriage. Once you get married, hey, that's great. God blesses that. And go ahead and have children when you're married to someone because when you're married to that person, you're saying you're going to be together till death do us part. You're vowing. You're, you're saying this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to stay together. And then you have children. And hey, that's great because you know what? Now you should have a mom and a dad. They're going to be there the entire time for your upbringing. That is the ideal. That is the way that God has set things up and things to work. Now, <laughs> and and this, this is common among anyone who has a, man, a real man, a real woman in the home that have children. The women are a lot more nurturing and caring and sensitive to, to you know, the children getting hurt and, 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 you know, keeping them out of trouble and stuff. Dads have a lot more of a hands-off type of approach and a, lo a lot rougher, Right? So like when, when, it, when it, the, the child falls down or gets hurt, mom's always there to be real comforting and, and, to, and to console the child and just be, be real uh, you know, emotional and, 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 and helpful in that sense. And look, kids need to have that. That's great. But you know what? Kids also need to have the dad that's going to wrestle with them and rumble and tumble and kind of toughen them up a little bit too and say, hey, you know, get up. You fell down yet, get up. You know, you don't need to, to sit there and cry about it and teach them those types of attributes and those types of skills to, to, to get a good balance that they don't just always need to be coddled all the time when something goes wrong. That they could learn how to, to, to get their skin a little bit more thick and to absorb some of the, the, the bruises and the punches and just to keep on moving and going forward. And, and, you know, dads provide a different outlook than moms do. And you know what? Moms and dads are both great. But God gave us these, these different skill sets and attributes to properly impart that unto the children so that children can grow up with both and having both. But today we have this, this weird, you know, social justice mentality among the young people that they need their safe spaces and you can't say anything offensive and that should just be against the law and we need to shut these people up because I don't want to cry because someone said something I didn't like. Get over it. And it's, and it's disgusting to me that people are even, even have this type of a mindset out there. It's like, what is wrong with you people? We've had, you know, I've worked at the same job now for a real long time. And there's a, we have a warehouse. And I don't work in the warehouse, but I, I worked, when I was growing up, I worked in a, in a machine shop. You know, it's a bunch of dudes in a machine shop. And you, 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 you know, had a little horse play and stuff going around and, a lot of a lot of trash talking and 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 going bantering back and forth, right? And you deal with it. And back then, when I was going, you know, if someone was to be a little sissy, oh man, forget it. you wouldn't last at that company very long at all. If you just had this, if you're just a little cupcake that that would cry every time someone said something mean to you or something nasty that you couldn't handle. I'm serious. It's the same way when I was in school too. I mean, if it was like you know, the kids these days, they wouldn't last a second. But that's not the way it is anymore. Now it's, I'm going to go talk to the manager. You know, I'm gonna, you know, and, and people have gotten so sensitive to nonsense. So people are literally like, like, like throwing tantrums and in tears over like something as stupid as the president. You know, like, like who's elected president? Like, Seriously? So this is why the sermon's being preached, okay? Because this, this, <laughs> this is a fundamental truth that isn't even, you know, this word is in the Bible one time. And it's letting us know that it's a sin, but I think even God's saying, look, I've given you naturally these instincts so that you know 
right from wrong, that men and women are different. I've given men testosterone and I've given women estrogen and it completely makes them different people. And it's, it's inherent. You don't have to be a Christian to understand these things at all. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. Because there's another reason why this is so important. Now, obviously, being effeminate, this is focused on men. Okay? This is something that is sin that, that only a man can do. Now, you can look at the, the flip side. You know, women, you shouldn't be manly. Now, there's no verse I could point to that says women don't be manly. Don't be like a man. But it, it's, it's implied. You could, you could come to that conclusion, I think, very reasonably. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 27. The Bible reads, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Man, not mankind necessarily, but man specifically, was created in the image of God. Of God, which means in God's likeness, after his own appearance, if you will, he, he made man to be like an image of himself. And this is again, this is a good reason why it's so important. Why I'm even preaching on this, not just first Corinthians six, but being a man in general, God is creating us after his image. We don't want to change that image into something that's not at all resembling God whatsoever. God of the Bible, the God of the Bible is always, first of all, male in gender. Always, without fail. And again, these days you got people trying to neuter the Bible and make it genderless. And, and you know, because we got these morons out there with these gender identity issues. Oh, I don't know if I'm a, if a boy or a girl or a man or what. Like. <laughs> it's madness. It, it, it truly is just completely unconscionable that there are people out that this is even tolerated at all for someone to be to, to not have to not be said you are nuts and you have a mental disorder seriously if you th if you don't know if you're a man or a woman if you're having these types of doubts or questions it, you, you don't get any more basic than that more elementary like do you need to go back to kindergarten do you need to learn one plus one and blue and yellow and your colors? I mean, boy, girl, this is, this is basic stuff. But all throughout the Bible, God is the male gender. So let's start when we're, we're looking at the sin of being effeminate with our appearance. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because if God created us in his image, I believe this is referring to Physically. He physically created us in his image. And there are many indications when you look at a person, just if you look at any individual to identify whether or not they are a man or a woman. And you don't have to ask them what they identify as. There's many visible signs to indicate whether a person is a man or a woman. It's not it's not up for debate. It's 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 a fact. God has created men and women differently. But our appearance, how, how we look, you can be effeminate, men, in the way that you look. We want to stay away from this sin of being effeminate. Because look at, and here's the other thing I want to point out, look at the sins that are, are grouped in with the sin of being effeminate in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Idolaters. And we've talked about that this morning, you know, people who make graven image and, and, and worship them. He says, under the third and fourth generation, he's gonna, you know, God's gonna, gonna be pouring out his judgment against those people, essentially. Um, fornicators, adulterers, adulterers receive the death penalty. Abusers of themselves with mankind. I'm not even gonna get into what that's all about, but, you know, there, there's, there's so many sins here that are listed. And he's saying, look, you're not gonna inherit the kingdom of God. It's a serious sin. It's something that, that God's like, oh, well, God doesn't care the way you look. Yes, he does. God doesn't care the way I act. Yes, he does. Amen. God cares about these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at, look at reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. 
and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovereth, uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed, excuse me, ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Now there's that reference again. We already saw in Genesis chapter 1 that God made man in his own image. This is being reiterated again now here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They're saying that a man ought not to cover his head. Guess what? God cares about your appearance. Why does God care about your appearance? Because he is the image and glory of God. That's why God cares. God's created you in his image and he doesn't want you screwing up that image to everyone else of who God is. So he says, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Verse number 10, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? The Bible is saying, look, nature itself teaches you that just naturally, without the Bible, without Christianity, without, without these things, doesn't even just your instincts tell you that it's a shame for a man to just have long hair? Of course it does, because that's not the way that God created man. God created men to look like men and women to look for women. And, you know, people say, oh, do you think, what do you mean God cares about the length of my hair? He's got half of a chapter of the Bible dedicated to this subject. And when you say, what does this mean being covered and uncovered? Is this talking about those women that go into church and they've got their little bonnets on their heads and the men don't? No. And look, some people will take it and, and, and run with that and say, that's what this verse is talking about. That's what this passage is talking about, your head being covered physically with some kind of a hat, which doesn't make any sense because, first of all, the, the men in the Old Testament, they had bonnets. The, the, the Levites that did the service of the Lord, they did have hats. But what this is saying, and we can see as it continues to talk about you know, let a woman, if, if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Shorn is talking about your hair being cut short verse number um but um verse number 15 but if a woman have long hair it is a glory to her for her hair is given her for a covering just completely defines what the word covering is being used at throughout this chapter her hair is given her for a covering and that explains it right there uh, you know being a shame for a man to have a covering is long hair and it being good for a woman to have a covering, meaning long hair. And, and this is the distinction. God's saying, you know what? Men, short hair. Women, long hair. There's one difference right there. Why? Because men, you are created after the image of God. Which tells you God doesn't have long hair. Which tells you Jesus didn't have long hair, as the sodomites want to tell you and depict in their pictures and the little paintings that they make of them. And, you know, and just so you know, those paintings of Jesus Christ, they are not from an eyewitness of Jesus Christ. That's just what some, again, some pervert came up with in his own mind of what Jesus looked like. Not anything resembling him. I mean, because for one, Jesus is like clean shaven, but we know Jesus had a beard in the Bible. This shows Jesus with long hair. Jesus didn't have long hair. In many of these depictions, Jesus is just like white. Right? And I highly doubt that Jesus was white. I mean, he was a Jew. Right? He's probably some shade of brown, like not, not, not just some pure white blood Aryan or something you know, in, in, in Israel. So um, anyway, yeah, don't believe those, those images that you see. And it's always funny, as a total side note, when you run into people that are like, oh, I saw, you know, I saw Jesus in a dream. It's like, well, what did he look like? Oh, he was all white and he had this long hair. And, you know, he didn't see Jesus. <laughs> you, saw, you saw what you've been told Jesus looks like. But that's about it. So anyhow, I don't want to get too far off on that. Being effeminate, first of all, and this is a real easy one, guys. You got long hair, get a haircut. 
Because if you don't, if you have long hair, you're being effeminate. Because that is the way that women are supposed to look, not men. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. Because now we're going to look at a few of the attributes and duties of women from the Bible. Because again, being effeminate means you're being like a woman. You're being feminine. You're being the way that women are. So what are some feminine attributes in the Bible? First Peter chapter 3, verse number 7. The Bible says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, we know that Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman says that the virtuous woman has strength, right? And that's good. You know, women shouldn't just be total wimps and weaklings. They can have their own strength, but they are the weaker vessel. So men, you should not be getting beaten up by some women or women shouldn't even, you know, have that, that strength over you. I mean, God designed men to have much more strength than he did to have women. And I'm not saying, you know, the Bible says that bodily exercise profiteth little. There is a little bit of profit to it just in general. But you shouldn't let yourself go, men, to just be a total wimp and weakling and, and not be able to, to, to handle yourself and defend yourself. And think about this. I do think it's important that men should, should have the ability to defend themselves and to defend their families in a physical confrontation with somebody. I think as the, the, the head of your house, as someone who is in charge, who is the leader, you ought to be able to at least defend yourself you know, without just, just rolling over because you're a wimp and a weakling and you have, you have no stamina and you, and you can't do anything and you're just, just helpless. See, that is a manly attribute to be strong. And it is effeminate to be the weaker vessel, to be, to be weak. And look, I'm not saying you just need to be pumping out of the gym seven days a week and, you know, and just building up some huge body. That's not it at all. But you ought to have some strength. I'm going to read for you from Jeremiah 51. Um, turn, if you would, to Job 38. Job 38. And keep, well, keep a finger, if you haven't yet, in 1 Peter 3, because we're going to come back to that. If you keep, keep a bookmark in 1 Peter 3, we're going to come right back to that. But turn to Job 38. Jeremiah 51.30 says, The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to the fight. They have remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. So it's talking about the mighty men of Bab Babylon, right? Have forborne to fight. They have remained in their holds. They didn't come out to fight. Their might, you know, these mighty men, their might failed and they became as women. So it's, it's associating women with not having that might, not able to fight, not able to go out to battle and to be strong. That is a womanly, as a feminine attribute. So women, that's great. If you're a woman and you don't have all this strength to go out and fight some battle, hey, you're being a woman. And that's why we should have women in the military because that is a feminine attribute not to just have all this physical strength to go out and fight some battle on the battlefield. But men, if you don't have the strength to be able to go out in there and defend yourself and, and get into a battle, then that is feminine. And that is being effeminate. Men are to be strong. And, and this could be, I mean, I, I think I've preached an entire sermon on this before, just the attribute of men being strong and having strength. You could find this all throughout the Bible of, of men that need to be strong. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Be strong. And I don't think that the Bible is just talking about physically strong there either. Because he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Men ought to not just be physically strong, but mentally, spiritually, and emotionally strong. You're in Job 38. Job had a lot that he suffered and went through. We all know the story of what happened to him, how he lost all of his wealth. He lost his children. 
He, he had boils and sores. I mean, he was, he was really broken down and lost everything. It's very understandable for anyone of us to look at that and say, yeah, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how strong I can be through a situation like that. And we see even his friends now are just saying, come on, Job, just tell us, what did you sin? Just confess your sin, Job. What did you do that was so bad and so wrong? You know, we must have done something because God wouldn't have done this to you if you, didn't, you, know, if you weren't in sin. And railing on him falsely and accusing him falsely because he didn't do anything wrong and it wasn't of God. It was Satan that was attacking him, not God. And dealing with all of that. But look at how, how the Lord speaks to Job. And this is telling. Verse number one. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. He's basically saying, Stand up, Job. Get up. What are you doing? Under you? Get up. Gird up your loins like a man. And answer me. I've got some questions for you. He's not coddling Job. Through everything that Job went through, the Lord's not coddling him. He starts asking him a lot of hard questions, saying, okay, where's all your knowledge, huh? Where were you when I did this? Where, you know, do you understand the way this works and the way that works? You know, and this goes on and on and on. Just further you know, laying into Job a little bit. Okay? Now, these are manly attributes. This is, this is the way that men are, the way that men deal. Look, this is different than the way that women are, and the way that women deal with things, and the, you know, and the sensitivity and, and everything else that I was saying earlier. And that's great for women to be like that. But that's not the way God created men. We do not want to get into Mr. Sensitive. Now look, Mr. Sensitive has been promoted and taught and pushed and getting crammed down the society's throat from when I was little all the way up. And it's, and it's this, you know, through, especially through the movies and these TV shows and stuff and, oh, the sensitive guy and, you know, oh, why do these girls, they're always going after the bad boys, but I'm Mr. Sensitive and, you know, and all this other nonsense trying to show you and, and, and paint this picture of saying, oh, in the end, you know, Mr. Sensitive is going to win out and that's, you know, like, and just emasculating the guy and saying, see, this is what a good guy should be. Just, just totally fe effeminate. And it's disgusting. And, and without the, you know, God's word and the truth to shine on that, that's, I mean, the whole world just eats it up. Yeah. Satan's deceptive, deceiving the world out there. And, and, it's, and it's so simple. It's so rudimentary. It's so basic. God has taught us, to, you know, has, has made us to be a certain way. And, uh, we shouldn't just be letting the, the world dictate how men should be. We should let the Bible do that. Look at, um, where you, go back to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to point this out too because being meek and humble are great attributes to have. Moses was, was more meek than any man upon the earth. As the Bible says he was, he was a meek man. He had humility. You can be meek and humble, but he's, here's the thing. You can be meek and humble without being pushed around right. and without just being some pushover that anyone could do anything to and just some wimp and some weakling. Don't associate the two together because they're different things. We have a tendency to say, oh, he's real meek and just, just anyone could do anything to him and, and whatever. Part of being strong is being unmovable, steadfast. Not, you know, fa in facing opposition and, and not being backed off at all. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 4 reads, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. This is talking about women having a great value on having that meek and quiet spirit. And this is referring to women as, as opposed to a woman being some obnoxious, loud mouth, tell everybody the way things are going to be, right? That's not the way that God designed women to be. He says that women, hey, when you, when you have an ornament, you, you, you um, are, um, 
dressing yourself with a meek and quiet spirit, in God's eyes, that is a great price of a high value because that's the way that God wants women to be, is to be meek and quiet. And again, being meek isn't just for women, but, but meek and quiet spirit is something that is godly attribute for women. Um, now Moses, as I mentioned, he's a meek man, and we know the Bible also says that the meek shall inherit the earth. Right? So it's a good attribute. It's not that being meek is a bad thing for men or for women. Or, you know, that is, is not dictated by the, by, the, by the gender. But remember, Moses wasn't just falling all over himself to Pharaoh. He was demanding, hey, let the children of Israel go. He was meek. But he was not just apologizing and saying, I'm sorry, you know, but God's just saying and we got to do this and, you know, I, I can't, I'm sorry, but I, I can't go against God. That's not being meek. That's being a wimp. There's a difference. Meek is the opposite of being proud and arrogant and lifted up. Moses did not put stock in who he was as a person saying, well, you better listen to me, Pharaoh, because I'm so, don't you know I'm Moses? He was meek. He didn't esteem himself highly, but at the same time, he wasn't a wimp. He said, let me, you know, the Lord does say that the Lord, let my people go. And here's what's going to happen. You don't do this, Pharaoh. There's going to be plagues that are going to come down. And Moses had, or Pharaoh had to entreat Moses saying, please, you know, Moses, have God get, you know, get rid of these plagues, get rid of these frogs, get rid of these lies. You know, he was a great leader. He was able to tell people what to do. He was able to, 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 to stand firm and to stand strong and still do that meekly. Let's not confuse what being meek is with being effeminate. And you know what? Apply this to going out and, and giving the gospel. We ought not to be apologetic when we go out, men, and preach the gospel. I mean, none of us should be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, first of all. The Bible says it's the power of God and the salvation. But we ought not to be apologizing and falling over ourselves when we're preaching the word of God and just, just oh, I'm sorry. Well, this is what the Bible says. You know, look. Just stand on the word of God. You don't have to be arrogant and proud about it, but just say, hey, this is what the Bible says. Right. And you can be firm right. and, and solid and still remain meek and humble. Right. We're going to read now. I, we read verse 4 in 1 Peter 3, but we're going to read it in more context, verses 3 through 5, because there's many attributes that are godly attributes for a woman to have. And... They're also contrary to the woman's sinful nature, right? We all have the flesh. So our, our fleshly nature sometimes will, will, will draw us one way. But the way that, that God says, no, this is a feminine attribute to have, they, they're often contrary to each other. And it's the same thing with men can have that too. There's, there's, some, there's certain attributes. I'm not saying everything. I'm not just saying, you know, there are definitely some things that come naturally. They're naturally feminine and naturally masculine. That, that's what we gotta be. But there's a few other things where you got to work on that a little bit more. It might not be natural, ladies, to submit yourselves. That might not be natural for you. But it is a feminine attribute to do that. And that is something that's commanded over and over again throughout the Bible. Uh, keep that in mind as we read now 1 Peter chapter 3, Look at starting at verse number 3. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God or, or, or adorned themselves, being in subjection under their own husbands. And what, we, what we're seeing here is a little bit of a contrast of, you know, the outward appearance of the woman versus what's really important, their inner appearance, their, their, their meek and quiet spirit. So what we're seeing here and what is just commonly known anyways is that women in general are concerned with how they look with their appearance, with putting on the jewels and the, and the dresses and you know, all these different things and what people think about them. And I can't go out looking like this and all these other things. That is a womanly and naturally feminine attribute to just be concerned about your makeup, about your hair, about all these various things. Again, 
Anybody can tell you. You don't have to be a Christian to understand that. This is the way that women are. And this is why he's bringing that up and saying, okay, instead of worrying about your outer appearance so much, why don't you worry about that meek and quiet spirit? Why don't you worry about being submissive? Because then he goes on in this chapter and goes and talks about Sarah and how she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord and everything else, and, and had that great feminine quality of being submissive to her husband. But that's something that, and the reason why it's being brought up in detail in 1 Peter 3 is because that's a little bit against their sinful nature. The sinful nature is going to tell you not to submit to anyone or anything. The godly feminine attribute is going to say, be meek, be quiet, be, you know, ha have this type of a spirit about you and, and submit. But godly or ungodly, a feminine attribute is being concerned about your outward appearance. And this is where I'm going with this because that is the way that women are. So men, another way to be effeminate is to be just super concerned about your wardrobe and about what's in fashion and, and how do, oh man, my hair is out of place right here. Oh, I got, you know, like, look, that is very effeminate to be over concerned. Now, I'm not saying that you just walk out of the house like stinking and and completely disheveled and you know and just and just having no concept at all of how you look but there's a huge difference between being able to just get dressed and look normal when you go out the door and spending an hour in the bathroom getting all your hairspray and putting on your little tight jeans and everything else because you're worried about being in fashion and all this other nonsense that is being effeminate. Okay, and we got a lot of that these days. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. You can dress well, men, without worrying about being into fashion. Guys that are into fashion are effeminate. I, I, there, I said it. If you're really into fashion and, and who the name brands are and all this other stuff, look, that's effeminate. Women care about those things. Men should not care about those things at all. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5 says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So, you know what? God does care about the way you look. But he's not telling you, you know, about what you wear, what you put on. But he's not telling you to spend an hour in the bathroom before you go out of the house because you're worried about how you look. He's just saying, look, man, I made you to be men. You wear men's clothing. And women, you wear women's clothing. That's pretty rudimentary and basic. He's not saying what fashion you need to have and everything else. He's just saying, look, dress like a man. Women, dress like women. Because if you don't do that, you're an abomination. And you know what? If you can do that, that's good enough in God's eyes. You can walk out of the house and say, you know what? I'm dressed like a man today. I've got a pair of pants on. I've got a work jacket on. Whatever. I'm going to go out and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work. There you go. You're, you're doing good. You're not wasting a bunch of time in vain, worried about your vain appearance. Another way for men to be effeminate is when they're married and they submit themselves to their wives and they let their wives run the household. Colossians 3.18, look at verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Ephesians 5 says the exact same thing, goes into even further detail. It is a feminine attribute, it is, it is the role that God has placed on women to be in subjection and to submit themselves. So when a man is doing that to the woman and reversing those roles and submitting himself unto the wife, he's being effeminate. When he's letting her make all the decisions and her be in charge and her run the house. That is effeminate. And that is a sin. And that is wicked. I don't care if it's easier for you. Well, I just don't want to fight with her. I just want to have... It. Look, establish yourself as the head of that household, man. Man up and, and do your job. Be the leader. Be the ruler. Because that's where God has put you at. Don't let the woman usurp the authority over you in the house. 
Turn your foot to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Another attribute of being effeminate are guys that are indecisive and that can't just make a decision. That is a lot more common among women to be in that position than for men. Now, ultimately, you know, n neither men or women really should just be completely indecisive. The Bible says in, in James 1, uh, verse 6, But let him that ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Not being able to oh, I don't know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, and just being double-minded about everything. That's not a good attribute to have man or woman. But, excuse me, it's a lot more feminine to have that type of an attribute. And the reason why is because God has ordained for the man to rule over the woman, which means that the man makes the decisions and is in charge. I mean, anyone who's a ruler or a leader is making decisions. Can you imagine if we had a ruler, a governor, a president, or whoever that just couldn't make any decisions? I mean, <laughs> whatever you're leading or ruling or governing, nothing's going to go well for you at all. Because nothing's going to get done whatsoever. You're not going to, you can't lead. I mean, it's, 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 it's laughable. Well, it's the same way in the house. It's the same way in anything that you're doing. If you're in charge of being a leader, you have to make decisions. You have to be able to say, this is what we're going to do. And not have to just, just always be second guessing and dying. Oh man, I don't know. Is this right? Is this right? Make the decision. Now, we have a lot more, um, it's a lot easier for that to be a feminine quality because Women aren't put in these, these positions of being leaders that just have to make these decisions. And we find oftentimes that women are more like that. Look at Genesis 3, verse 16. The Bible reads, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So just like we saw in Colossians chapter 3, as you'll see in Ephesians chapter 5, and we see in Genesis chapter 3, 16, here, that the, the, the man is to rule over his wife. The husband ruling over his wife. Men are to rule over their wives and their household. If you can't be decisive, then you can't rule well. Turn if you would to John chapter 6. We're almost done. I got a couple more points. John chapter 6. Guys that are over-emotional or extremely sensitive, guess what? That's effeminate too. Now, it's not effeminate for a man to shed a tear, to weep, to have some sorrow. We see men of the Bible that have done that very thing. And we see Jesus wept. We saw David wept. You know, but it, it, it definitely was not something that characterized those people. I know today people want to characterize David or those people being the weeping prophets or whatever, and, and they try to characterize them that way, but that's not, um, that wasn't who they were. You know, David was a, was a valiant man and a, and a, and a, a mighty man of strength and, and uh, led a lot of battles. I mean, he wasn't just always crying himself to bed in a corner or something. Now, he talks about his tears on his pillows and you know, these psalms and these songs unto God and using that, that poetic language, which again, there, there's, there's, there's emotion there and there's heart there, but um, that doesn't define anything, like, you know, like really who they are. Um, being sensitive, I'll cover that first. Psalm 119, verse 165, the Bible reads, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know, we, get, we live in a, in a day where people get offended over everything. Just, oh man, I can't believe you said that. Oh man, don't say that. Don't you? Look, when you love God's law, you're going to have great peace and nothing shall offend you. You shouldn't be offended easily. I mean, I don't get offended. You know, it, it's funny that we can speak to people and, get, and make people offended all the time, but then they talk to us and it's like, I don't get offended. You know, I don't care what you have. People are saying, oh, I don't, want, I don't really want, I don't think you want me to talk about religion. Yeah, I do. That's why I knocked on your door. Oh, don't get me started. I, I don't want to offend you. Uh, don't worry. You're not going to offend me. I've heard it before, okay? Just because you may have some stupid beliefs doesn't mean that I'm just going to get offended by what you believe in. 
And we shouldn't be easily offended, especially men. I mean, look, don't be so sensitive that people can't say something to you. Don't be, you know, men, you should not be having to be worried about hurting a man's feelings. Okay? That is something that, that is just, because that's not strength. Men are to be strong. And if, if someone's just going to say something to you or say, oh, man, you hurt my feelings. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I mean, you imagine to hear a guy say that? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Look at the way that Jesus dealt with people being offended at what he preached and what he said. And look at how he responded to them. Notice how he doesn't just coddle them and say, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Oops. John chapter 6. Look at verse number 61. This is when Jesus Christ said, look, I'm the bread of life. You know, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood, basically, to, to be saved, to have, to have eternal life. And they're just like, whoa, what are you talking about there? You know, and they got all, all flipped out about it. In John chapter 6, verse 61, Jesus says, uh, the Bible says, When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? He said, oh, does that offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. From that time, look at this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. He lost a lot of people after this preaching. After this sermon, when he, when he was teaching here in John chapter 6, a lot of people were just like, okay, I don't know about this guy anymore. And they got offended at what he said, and they stopped following him. Those are his disciples, I mean, people who were following him and listening to him and said, oh, okay, whoa, this is too much. And they got offended at what he was saying. But look at how Jesus responds to this then. It says, verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Unto his closest twelve, right? The, the people, his, his, the apostles, the disciples. He, closes, he looks at them and says, oh, will you also go away? So, so you, you're going to leave too? Go ahead. I mean, you can't handle it. If you can't handle the preaching, then go ahead. And this is one of the reasons why I think people now are loving this movement that we're a part of. And thank God that I get to be a part of this also, of, of people who are literally moving from locations from one area to go to churches to where pastors aren't coddling the congregation and aren't afraid to preach the truth. Amen. Because they have this attitude of what? Are you going to go also? Look, I'm going to preach God's word for what it says. You can take it or leave it. You know what? I know a lot of people love the word of God and they're not offended by it. And those are the people that are going to come to church like this because they love God's word and they want to hear it. Amen. And they don't want to, to listen to someone who's just afraid to speak the word of the Lord. I don't want to sit and listen to that. Just come out and say it. Right. If this is what God said, then thunder it from the rooftops. <coughs> Jesus' attitude, are you going to go away also? It's funny how similar that is to, to God speaking to Job. Get up and gird up your loins like a man. Oh, wait, actually, it's not that funny because Jesus is God. <laughs> But, um, you know, they have that attribute. And look, men, you're made in the image of God. <laughs> Last point on being effeminate. Because I, I want to make sure that this is clear, that everyone knows what it means when you're being effeminate. Any attribute that is feminine in nature or feminine according to the Bible, if you're doing that as a man, you're being effeminate. Last point is that you could turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 if you'd like. But guys that gossip and are busybodies yeah. and talking about other people, guess what? That is a feminine attribute. Amen. Now, that is not a good feminine attribute. Okay, again, that is sinful for women to be busybodies and talking about. But you know what? That's what women do. That is their sinful flesh doing that. And men, when you're doing that, not only are you in sin too because you're being a busybody and a tattler, but you're also being effeminate. So add that to the list. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, talking about the younger widows, the women widows, 
mind you, not the men widows, the women widows, the younger ones, and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speech, speaking things which they ought not. <coughs> now today, we have a certain technology that makes it really easy for people to be busybodies and to be tattlers and to be involved in other people's business and to go gossiping and talking about other people, and it's called the internet. It's called Facebook. And listen up, man, it's effeminate for you to be looking at what everyone else is doing and going around, oh, how's this person? And then talking about these people and getting in your own little groups and creating your own little private Facebook group so you can go talk about other people in the church or other people that you know. Look, you're being effeminate. Knock it off. Stop being a busybody. Stop being a tattler. Be a man. Amen. Who even cares about this stuff anyways? <laughs> Do you know how little time I spend on Facebook at all? Like, I don't care what people are up you know, I care about my family. I care about some of my friends. I'm a little bit interested in what they're doing. But you know what? I'm busy. I got a lot of things going on. And I'm not just going to waste my time looking at what everyone's having for lunch today. <laughs> Seriously. Or what games you're playing and, and what, what, you know, what, what you want for your stupid game. Man up. Stop being effeminate. When you act effeminate, and this is probably the worst part of being effeminate, you run the risk, listen up, men, you run the risk of being misidentified as a faggot. You run the risk of being looked at as a sodomite, as being a queer. You don't, you don't look, no Christian should want to be mistaken for, oops, oh, I thought you were a homo. But when you start acting effeminate, when you start talking effeminate, when you start dressing and, and worrying about the way you look, when you start getting into other people's business, when you're not very strong, you're real weak, when you're crying all the time and people offend you, look, people are going to think that you're a homo because that's what the flaming faggots of this world are like. That's what the homos are like. And, you know, on the TV, the, 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 they, that's what they would make fun of. Back when I was growing up, they don't do that anymore. Should I mean it should? It, it's disgusting. You shouldn't even be laughing about it. But it, you know, in general, it, it's not. It's not a. It's not a laughing matter. It's disgusting. But when you act effeminate, you're running that risk. Now, I'm not saying if you if you've you know you're a little bit off on one of these points that people are just going to think that you're a homo. But you're on your way to to, to getting there. People need, men need to man up in 2017 and just, and just be a man, okay? If you don't know what that is, look, just get in the Bible a little bit. Look, there, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of great examples of men of God. And, and it shouldn't take much to realize, wait a minute, I see a lot of women being like this and doing this. I mean, just, just kind of pay attention around you in general. Because still, we're not so perverted that it's just totally backwards yet. You should still be able to understand what it's like naturally to be a man. Let's be man. Let's, you know what? As, and as Christians, let's show the world what it means to be a man or to be a woman. Women, be feminine. Men, don't be feminine. Simple as that. Real easy topic tonight. If you walk away with nothing else, just say, you know what? Oh, I'm a man. Okay, I, I shouldn't be feminine. That's the point of this sermon. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for making us different. God, I love my wife. I'm glad that you made women the way that you made them, dear Lord, and, and men the way you made us. God, I pray that you please help us to bring honor and glory unto your name by the way that we look, by the way that we act, by recognizing that we as men are made in the image of God, dear Lord, and that we are going to <clears throat> just show the world that, that you know, <laughs> there, yes, there is a difference between men and women, and no, it's not that difficult, and, and people that can't understand the difference are insane. Lord, help us to bring some sanity to an insane world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.